Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. On today's show, I will be discussing a high profile missing person case. The phenomenon of missing persons is important to Rich Planet for a number of reasons. Let's first rephrase this phenomena so it is more accurately described. Just because somebody is reported as missing does not necessarily mean that person is missing to everyone who knows them. I prefer to describe missing people as those who are no longer visible to a public audience. This phrase can also apply to people who have been reported as deceased, but no evidence exists to show that they died. There are people reported to have died who I would not be confident to describe as dead, but just no longer visible to a public audience. I include the Labour MP Joe Cox in this category. Please watch my film on that case uh, if you don't understand that comment. There are a number of allegedly dead famous people who I would hesitate to describe as dead and prefer to use no longer visible to a public audience. Perhaps I can include victims of dubious or fake terrorist attacks in the no longer visible to a public audience category too. Intelligence agencies regularly give people new identities for a range of reasons. People who they want to release from prison early, but whose lives might be at risk. One example is Maxine Carr, who was given a new identity in 2004. I've had a tip-off on where she is currently working. Apparently, only a few people where she works know who she really is. If the security services have a department responsible for changing persons' identities, could this practice be being used far more often than we realise and for reasons that most have not considered? The missing person I am going to discuss today is Richie Edwards of the Welsh rock band The Manic Street Preachers. And here to help me delve into this mystery is Richie Edwards' friend and schoolmate Richard Fry. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me. As I said, you were a um, yeah. school friend of uh, Richie Edwards, yeah. and we're going to delve into that in some detail today. Um, and this program is not going to be a bit Bob Lazar, but it might get a bit Steve Strange. Um, hmm. Music lovers might know that name. <laughs> so tell us uh, first, Richard, just give us a bit of background <coughs> on the Mannix themselves, or that's what they refer to, the Mannix, the Mannix Street Preachers. Um, what type of band are they, where are they from, etc? Well, the Manic Street Preachers are a, an alternative rock band and they've got a, like a, a leftist um, political outlook. Um, they were formed in 1985 by uh, Sean Moore, uh, the cousins, cousins Sean Moore and James Bradfield, and also their friend Nicholas Jones. Um, they all went to Oakdale Comprehensive School together, which is where I went, and Richie went as well. Um, Sean and Richie and myself were in the one year, and Nick and James were in the year below. Um, <clears throat> so they, Oakdale Comprehensive School is in a town called Blackwood, which is a mining, a mining town, which was, at the time, it was being devastated by the Thatcher and it closed in the mines. Thousands of people were losing their jobs. So there was a, there's a strong feeling of hatred towards the government, mm -hmm. you know, generally, you know. Yeah. Um, and later on then, when Richie went to university, he became a Mannix fan and got involved with the Mannix while in university and eventually joined them. Mm -hmm. And became yeah. their lyricist. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, uh, Richie went missing, if you don't already know, in 1995, February the 1st, 1995. And he'd been in the band or playing in the band since 1989. So it's a good sort of four or five years. Yeah. Um, so it's a very uh, odd disappearance. We call it that. Some people think yeah. it was a suicide. So just because <clears throat> we are going to go into the evidence a little bit later, but just give us the 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 brief outline of his disappearance? Well, basically, because, um, I mean, I never followed the band myself up until the disappearance, um, for reasons I'll come to later. But it was basically, we were told that Richie had left his car at the Seven Bridge Services 
and basically disappeared. Um, because it was obviously by the Severn Bridge, it was hinted, to, hinted that he jumped off the bridge, but of course there's no evidence that he did that. Mm -hmm. um, and basically just been, ever since then, he's been just missing, mm -hmm. presumed, presumed to have committed suicide. Right, yes. And yeah. he'd had a number of um, psychological issues. Yeah. He'd been in rehab, uh, yeah, well, yeah. A, a, a mental health clinic, about six months yeah. earlier and had uh, done things like uh, self-harm which yeah. we're going to come on to yeah. and written about suicide yeah. as well right so yeah. there's those sort of themes mm. uh, and he was let's say a bit of a loner in terms of uh, within the band itself he was uh, sort of uh, someone who could shut himself away and was a bit yeah he was very deep yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, people often attribute that as to why he's either committed suicide or gone missing. It's sort of yeah. his, his it's mental, like, mental state. But like say. the in inevitable thing that would happen to him, really, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Now, um, so, so he's been missing for 24 years now and he is still missing, although I will stick with the no longer visible to a yeah, public audience yeah. and we'll, I'll explain yeah. why later. Uh, now, Richard has written a book about his friendship with Richie Edwards and his subsequent quest to try and find Richie Edwards. So just tell us a bit <coughs> about your new book, Richard. Well, um, this book, uh, <coughs> basically I started writing it um, at the beginning of 2018 um, with the inspiration of Your Good Self, Rich. Um, and it's, it's aimed at Richie fans, not so much, not so much Manix fans, but Richie fans. And um, I go into really, I talk about how I became friends with Richie, um, talk about our six year long friendship and how it ended. And then I tell the reader then a little bit about myself so that they can understand where I'm coming from, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Be yeah. Yeah. Because you're gay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I think you're the first gay yeah. we've had on the show, Richard. Well, uh, <laughs> one that you know about, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, yeah. so I just need to get um, an L, yeah. a B and a T on the show next. Uh, <laughs> and all the others. <laughs> yeah, and all the other new ones, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so really, yeah. The, the book also is a story about unrequited love, isn't it? Yeah, yes. You loved them, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Re yeah, it was my first... first well, I, my life, as far as I'm concerned, he was the love of my life, you know, and mm. I've never found anybody like Richie since. And right. And mm. so you, you met him when you were yeah. sort of, well, just about to go through puberty? Is it that sort yeah, of age? Yeah, yeah. Is it the, in the second, or th second year of the comprehensive school? Right. So, um, yeah, we was, some of us were already, you know, in the middle now, of puberty. Now, we've just touched on sexuality. Yeah. Um, you you claim that Rich Edwards was gay. Well, I yeah, right. Yeah, so think, yeah. some people might refute that. Rich, uh, reading mm. the book yeah. that's recently been written mm. about him, which we'll come on to, it kind of suggests that he's straight. He had a girlfriend yeah. or feelings for a girl or what yeah. have you. But it certainly leaves a question mark over his sexuality. Yeah. I would say. So yeah. what? Why? Why do you think he was gay? <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> he was very effeminate for a start, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good sign. People, we did a, a single press, we ended up, we did it all ourselves and just give them away. Um, we didn't bother playing where we came from. We just uh, got a couple of shows in London and phoned up lots of journalists, got them down, mm -hmm. we had a couple of reviews, then we got a manager, and then we got signed by Heavenly Records. Um, I mean, he'd never had a, as far as I know, he'd never had a proper girlfriend, he never had sex with anybody as far as I, you know, I, I, so I was told. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, we never talked about girls, never come into the conversation. Um, it's, it's just yeah. one of those things you you know, yeah. you know, yeah. you, it's like a gay dar, you know, you kind of know. Yeah, you're gay dar. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, now, obviously, yeah. th 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 as yeah. well, what the book uh, tackles very yeah. well is what life was like yeah. to grow up being yeah. gay in yeah. a Hard Valley's town, yeah. In the, after the, as you said, the Thatcher era, yeah. Because it it was poo pooed a bit, wasn't it? Even oh yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's not, I mean, homosexuality um, 
was you know, a big taboo, you know, years ago. I mean, it still is now to a degree, mm -hmm. you know, because of the, the you got the three reasons really. You got religion, because there was a lot of you know religion was a big thing, wasn't it? You know, years ago in the valleys, all Christianity, and they're mm -hmm. very anti-gay, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Then you got rugby. You know, kind of any any gays in in rugby, can you? Because sure. you know, you don't want the, the players enjoying the game for you know for those sorts of for reasons. the wrong reasons. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah. the in the baths and that. And then you got the mines. You know, when mm. the, you need to be oh, you need to be a big man. You know, to yeah. work in the mines. You know, you can't be you can't, you can't show your sensitive side or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, and steelworks. Yeah, well. and the steelworks. Yeah. So, and I think also like my family and Richie's family, our fathers, they were both old school. And our mothers were both very religious, mm. and it, sex was never talked about at yeah. all, never ever, mm. you know. And, but I, I was kind of lucky because my stepbrother was already come out as a gay, mm. so it was no, no big deal really, even though it was never talked about. But as for Richie, uh, my father and I, he was the only, the only person with a problem like that in his family, so he would have felt even worse than I did. Right. Yeah. And in the book, um, you sort of, there's numerous times where you almost come out to him. Oh, yeah, many. Uh, but yeah. never did. No, I you couldn't. You never told I, him. And you, you never, you <sighs> kind of, it's, well, I wouldn't yeah. say propositioned, but made a move oh. at one point. We'll not go yeah, into it. It's yeah, in, yeah, it's in yeah. the book. It's yeah, in the book, yeah. right? But that's a big regret, isn't it, for you? Uh, I, many regrets. I mean, obviously, in hindsight, one would make completely different decisions, you know, but um, again, I, I was I was brainwashed by my family, I suppose, and society into feeling that like it was wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I was afraid that if I did confess to Richie about how I felt, that he would, he would you know, adopt the same attitude and then I would be Im immediately mm -hmm. dropped from his circle of friends, or, you know, wherever. Mm -hmm. but, can I play devil's advocate and yeah. say, is it, is it become an obsession, do you think? Uh, I, well, everybody's obsessed with sex. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it is, I suppose, you know. Yeah. Um, and when, uh, you know, it's difficult to find a relationship, you do... I mean, a lot of, I know a lot of gay people, and they they are obsessed with. Se not as much, I mean, I'm not as obsessed with sex as people I know. Yeah. Some people are absolutely talking about it all the time, mm. but um, I'm not like that. So Richie himself, then. Yeah. So you, 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 it was a, you were in a chemistry class. Yeah. That's when you first met him. So just tell us what he was like at school mm. and and how your relationship progressed with him as friends first. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, it's just chance, really, that I sat next to Richie, and it, it just just clicked straight away. There's just something like like a chemistry between us, or in, in you know, um, in the chemistry in class. the chemistry class. Mm. And um, he was so he was cheerful, and um, I was I was very nervous because it was the first day in a new class. Mm -hmm. But he seemed to be really confident and cheerful, and. And just warmed to him straight away, and he sort of I, I thought of him really as an, like an older brother type, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we just our friendship just went on from there, and we used to meet every every lunchtime and mm -hmm. talk about yeah, what was on TV, yeah, everything, yeah, including yeah. Uh, Leonard Rossiter. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was as often a subject of conversation. The what was the series called? Um, yeah, um, the Fallen Rise of Reginald Perrin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the things we used to laugh at. Yeah, which is odd. Yeah, Consider well, yeah. Because Reginald Perrin faked yeah. his own death, didn't he? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, okay, so may I uh, read a short extract from your excellent book, Rich? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is um, in an RE lesson he's yeah. talking about. This is quite early on in the book. It's, he says, yeah. uh, One day, whilst we were being bored silly by Mrs. Jones in religious education, I decided to stick my finger down my trousers and out through the zip pretending it was my penis. Uh, then I elbowed Eddie to look down at my crotch where I waggled my pretend penis and sniggered quietly as not to disturb the rest of the class. Eddie giggled and I quickly pulled out my finger, taking care to not share the joke with anyone else. To my horror, after class, Eddie told almost everyone 
that Richard Fry was wanking in <laughs> RE. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, right. So um, your friendship with him went all the way up to after his first year at university. So he so um, which w was a bit of a sort of a sad part for you. Mm. Af af so he would be what sort of 19 or something like that. Yeah, he, well, he was eight months older than me, so, um, and, and I, I think I was a bit immature for my age as well, mm -hmm. so there was quite a big, you know, yeah. gap there, you know, intellectually, you know. Yeah, you went to visit him at university, you thought you were mm. due to stay there for a week, and it turned out not, and you were a bit upset, so mm. um, you didn't have a lot of mm. regular contact with him after that point, after 1987. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And he got involved in the Mannix in 88, mm. 89, mm. the following year. So you weren't friendly with him while he was in the Mannix. No, no. But you did speak to him a few times while he was in the Mannix. We'll come on to that. Right. Um, so you haven't written about the Mannix Street Preachers in your book at all, really. No, not really. Just no. about Richard yeah, Edwards. Yeah. Um, but you have written about mm. um, some of your own jobs, oh, mm. which, um, in my opinion, mm. is just as interesting, mm. if not more interesting. So <laughs> let me just read this. So you you took a job in a um, mm. in a pot noodle factory, mm. right? And how, how did you find that? It was great. Um, in those days, um, there was a lot of people working there then, because mm. these days it's all full of robots now. But there was a tremendous sense of camaraderie there. You know, uh, brilliant. Um, right. Well, let me just yeah. read this from Mitch's book. So he's he's took a job. So you were quite young then in 1986, um, and you were promoted up the ladder and to the job of checking how much was in the pots. Yeah. Uh, proudly carrying my clipboard like a doctor, I pranced around the factory floor in my white coat, taking samples. Uh, funnily, I thought I looked important, but everyone endearingly called me Dr. Dick. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes on to say that in the summertime, working in the pot noodle factory, um, the, f the heat from the frying machines on the shop floor would reach tropical levels regularly women would faint while on the job. Some of them would even fall asleep on production lines. One such day, I was working on the noodle fryer. This is where the noodles are fry dried and after being steamed. Working opposite me was a woman called Barbara, Sleepy Time Babs, I called her. She used to sit there half asleep with one eye open just in case the line supervisor showed up. She looked like a sack of potatoes in a pink overall, blue hairnet and floppy white hat. While slumped in her plastic chair, she kept her lazy eye peeled for rogue noodles that had defied the law of gravity and landed the wrong side up. Rows of eight noodles, each one in a metal basket, would pass by every two seconds. On seeing a rogue one, her short fat arm would stretch out to correct it, at the same time causing her already tight overalls to stretch around her back to nearly ripping point. It was like watching a three-toed sloth turn into the Incredible Hulk. This job was so boring that we tried to pass the time away by playing I Spy. However, this was not a good idea because Barbara couldn't spell. Subsequently, one day I spent ages trying to guess what she had spied that began with the letter S, only to uh, give up, then realise she had spied the ceiling. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, now, mm. um, yeah, so I've, I've brought one along for you, Richard, oh. so we can have uh, <laughs> that bring back any memories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, so this one is original, mm. original curry flavour, mm. and um, you actually gave some of these to Richie. Oh, yeah. So yeah, just tell yeah. us about that. Well, when he was in university, <clears throat> he asked me if I would get him some pot noodles because, obviously, they was on a tight budget in university. Mm. I suppose they wanted to spend all their money on booze. So um, he asked me to get some reject pot noodles, which were about, oh God, yeah. <laughs> which were about, um, I think it was like 50 pence for a dozen or something like that. So I bought him 10 dozen and he took them all back to university. And uh, it wasn't at the time, I didn't hear anything at the time, but later on I heard that he, was, he had so many of them that he was sick. Mm. And he was selling them as well, but, uh, which was naughty. But <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you know, <laughs> if you have the curry one, um, you will yeah. you will need uh, oh. <laughs> some of this. And uh, can I do my Mannix impression? Yeah, go on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I need my Mannix. <laughs> These are my uh, Richie Wire 
glasses. <laughs> All right. So with the pot noodle. Um, yeah. Oh, if you tolerate this. Then your toilet will be next. <laughs> so Richie had 120. Um, yeah, pot noodles, pot noodles, pot, pot spaghettis as well. Yeah, and um, he was selling them. I would have gone into trouble if my boss had known, right? Because they were rejects. Like, but right. um, you were allowed yeah. to take them to eat, but not to sell. Yeah, right. Yeah. So between the summer of 1987. Uh, and when he went missing the 1st of February 95, you didn't have much contact mm. with him, but d did you see him or communicate with him at all in that period? Yeah, um, well, I s saw him in Cardiff. I was shopping in Cardiff one Saturday morning, and um, I was walking past the Virgin Record store, mm. and I saw this figure standing there, and something drew me to towards, towards him. You know, I couldn't see who it was at first. And um, I realised then it, it was Richie and he was signing some autographs for a couple of girls. But I'd l and another one of my regrets is that I didn't go up to him and say hi, you know. Uh, but I was, I was af afraid of the reception I would get. But I shouldn't have been. I should have just, I mean, I couldn't, <laughs> mm -hmm. what was I going to lose? But I just, right. I just couldn't do it. After Richard's parting with Richie Edwards in 1987, he did speak to Richie a few times after that. Once in 1990, when Richie telephoned Richard and told him about the band, he asked Richard, who is a keen photographer, if he would do a photo shoot with the band. Richard Fry was delighted and agreed, and Richie said he would call him on a particular day to give him the details. That day came and went, and Richard thought he had been discarded, and missed Richie's further phone call. Then in 1993, Richard spoke to Richie on the phone, trying to re-establish contact. But Richie seemed uninterested and said he was going to Nicky Wire's wedding. That was Richard's last contact with Richie. Now, in that period when he was in the band, yeah. I've done my own little bit of research on the band, which yeah. I'm going to go through in a moment, yeah. just to flesh that time period out yeah. from... 1990 to 95 yeah. but just to jump forward for a second to I think it's 1999 yeah. tell us about the phone call oh yes um, well I had moved out from my parents house for about a year and um, I went back over to see my stepmother the one day and she said uh, oh somebody phoned for you in the middle of the night last night and she said I think it was Richie Edwards well I, well, and what year was this, Rich? There was um, about 19... Yeah, it was about 2000, wasn't it? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I've got late what, what 99 you, or early 2000. Yeah, it's about 2000. And um, I said, well, well, what did he want? You know, didn't you, couldn't you give him my phone number, you know, to give me... And she's forgotten my phone number, like, right? Well, nothing had prompted her to suggest it was Richie. You know, he wasn't talking about Richie. She just... Knew it was him because he used to phone me all the time, you know, when she knew his voice. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think who else it could have been. Could have been another friend. But I'd, I'd moved out. I'd been moved out at least a year by then. And even before that, I had my own landline put in the house. So all my friends, all my current friends, had my, my new phone numbers. So was, the only person it could have been, I think, was Richie. I mean... My stepmother is a pretty astute person, you know, she's not st stupid or anything. And um, it was in the middle of the night, which was very odd. You know, it was like one or two o'clock in the morning, you know, very... And I just wonder what he wanted, you know. Um, and if it was a sort of burning question, I'd love to know what, what... Did he want help or did he just want to get back in touch or what? I don't know, but... You think it was probably him? I think it... 99 to, well, 95% chance, I would say, right. was him, yeah. yeah. All right, and um, if we move forward even <clears throat> further, because you uh, knew Richie's mother quite well, yeah. and at one point she invited you to go and have a look at his bedroom. This is fairly recently, a few years ago, yeah. because she's passed away now. Just yeah. tell us about what happened there. Well, um, I used to bump into Richie's mother, Sherry, um, Fairly, well, fairly regularly. Um, I mean, it'd go for a year when I hadn't, didn't see her, you know. But um, I bumped into her in Sainsbury's and she was very friendly, gave me a hug and a kiss. You know, and she said, oh, you have to come over and see me one day, you know, have a cup of tea. So um, 
I couldn't wait, you know. I mean, I love Sherry. She's lovely, really. She was a lovely person. Um, she was like the mother I'd always wanted, like, you know. So anyway, I, I, um, I, I ring her up and arrange to go over to see her. So I go over there, and um, when I get there, she shows me around the bungalow. I mean, I've already, I mean, I know the bungalow anyway. I used to go there, you know, regular. But um, she showed me Richie's old bedroom, which she had done out into a spare room. And then she showed me a box room then where she was keeping Richie's things. Um, she showed me um, like, a, like a captain's desk and a, a matching chair with a leather, with a green leather insert. And she was explaining that she just had it all renovated, um, which I thought, well, if it was me, I'd rather keep all his little marks. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if it's, to remind me of him, you know, all his little marks that he made on it. You know, I, mean, I wouldn't want it all. I wouldn't want his erased from it. But while thought, he's while he's writing his yeah, lyrics, yeah, while he's writing all his lyrics, his famous desk where he did all his writing. And I thought, well, didn't think too much of it at the time. You know, we, um, but then she showed me um, on the wall. Then there was uh, some shelves of books, with some of his books on there. I mean, it was nowhere near as many books as he had, because I know what he was like. He had he had loads of books, and um, I, I also thought, well, where's his records? Because I, I couldn't see any of his albums there, because. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in that because I, I gave him an album for Christmas once. I, I'd love to have looked for it and saw it with my inscription on, you know, to Richie. And I thought, I, I didn't say anything to her at the time. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember thinking, well, well, where's all his That would be his a, album? a major part of his, well, his yeah. memory of him. Yeah. Because he was yeah. a huge music fan yeah. before he, he got involved <clears> in the band himself mm. with a big record yeah. collection. And, yeah. And that wasn't there. No, but Which I couldn't. See, I didn't see it. I couldn't. Yeah. I and, mean, uh, and that is probably one of the one yeah. things that yeah. he would definitely take with him if he was going to start well, yeah, his life. Yeah, well, I would have thought so. Mm -hmm. But um, I showing showing me his things. I, I got a little bit upset. You know, I, I had a tear in my eye. And um, I, 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 this is the first time I actually told Sherry that I loved Richie. You know, and I tried to explain to her, but I was. Again, I was afraid of expressing my feelings, you know, even in this day and age. And um, she could say I was a bit upset. And so she and she's just she comforted me. She said, oh, yes. It, oh, it is a sad story. You know, oh, it is a sad story, you know. And, but I thought nothing of it at the time because I knowing what I know now. I think, well, was she trying to tell me something? You know, yeah. is it just a story? Yeah. I Let don't me know. just say at this point, um, you suspect well, you don't know that the family know where he is. Yeah, I, yeah, it's and my belief. We'll come yeah. on to yeah. why, you, why you think that. Yeah. Um, now, in March this year, 2019, um, a book was published, which I have a copy of here, called um, <coughs> Withdrawn Traces, Searching for the Truth About Richie Manick. Now, that book has the approval of Richie's family, uh, who you know well, and um, it's essentially the official narrative of um, Richie's life and the disappearance story. Um, now, you told me about this book before it was published um, when I first met you back in 2017, uh, and you told me that it was due to be published in early 2018, and that was delayed. I think it was delayed more than once, Rich. Am I right about that? The, the, oh, the, the, at, least, at least twice, maybe three times, right. maybe more. Because right. yeah. there's a, a Manix forum called, um, I think it's called Forever Delayed, and it's about the fans getting um, impatient for the book. Yeah, because some of them had pre-ordered it, yeah. and then it was delayed. Yeah. Um, now, when in 2017, before yeah. it was published, when I read the synopsis that you showed me, yeah. the wording, um, just this mm. is just my opinion, mm. um, I thought this book's a cover-up. It's a cover-up yeah. for whatever really did happen. And I deduced that, my own opinion, just based on the synopsis. Mm. And then when I read the whole book, um, that was my mind made up. Mm. Uh, that it was a co it's a cover-up for what really happened and possibly for the reason why he had to become no longer visible to a public audience. That's my opinion. 